Let freedom ring out here. Let grace abound here. Let freedom ring out in this place. Let freedom ring out here. Let grace abound here. Let freedom ring out in this place. Come, come, spirit, take over my heart and over this place. Here we are, low before Majesty's light, Lord, we adore. So sing to me, sing away a brokenness that would separate, creating me integrity, a heart that rolls on and a soul that's free. Kingdom come, spirit, take over my heart and over this place. Here we are, low before. So sing to me, sing away A brokenness that would separate Creating me integrity A heart that rolls on and a soul that's free Welcome to St. Philip Lutheran Church. This is the contemporary service here, and we're so glad you've come in person to join us and those who have also joined us online. Well, we can tell it's fall. The air's gotten a little crisper, and the calendar this week has exploded. <laughs> so I'll do my best, and I hope I don't miss anything. Huh? On Tuesday, Tuesday's a big day. Book club meets at 10 o'clock in the morning. The dinner group meets at 6.30 p.m. and the pub ministry also meets that evening at 6.30 p.m. Wednesday we have Bible study the morning at 10.45 and the evening at 6.45, or Tuesday, 10.30 in the morning, 6.45 in the evening. Um, choir practice and crossing practice are back on Thursday. Maybe. Okay, maybe. <laughs> okay. And part of the official business two weeks from today we will have a congregational meeting. It is our annual nominating meeting. It will be in person following this service. It will recess and we'll reconvene in person following the 11 o'clock service. And the virtual Zoom one will be at 11 o'clock. So you have three opportunities, in person at 9 and 11, or virtual at 11. Two weeks from today, October 9th. We are also collecting food for the uh, North Raleigh Ministry Food Drive. There's a bin either in the narthex or the back of this worship space, so you can bring anything in all month, leave it there, and the uh, men's pub ministry is um, shuffling that down to the food bank because they uh, seem to be a more dire need in October than they are near the holidays. So if you can help out that way, your help is greatly appreciated. We are also collecting coats. There are kind of those bright lime green bins that you will find in the hallway or the narthex. If you have a coat that's um, slightly used but it's clean and functioning and you no longer need it, please bring it in. These get taken down to Cedar Point apartments. There are a lot of refugee families there and they can certainly use these. And I think I touched on everything, I hope. Anybody else have anything? All righty. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Pastor. Well, actually, I have a couple things. This is my son, Grant. Hey, Grant. Grant. <laughs> it's my son, Tristan. <laughs> I've got two sons. 
So one of them is named Grant. He's not here. This is Tristan, <laughs> and this is his mom, Zudi. This is his first time coming up here, so it is a delight to have him with you. You waved to everybody. Say hi. <laughs> and the second announcement is concerning the uh, pub ministries food drive for North Raleigh Ministries. That is the, am I right, Shelly? I can't read it from here. Is that the white crate in the back and it's got a sign on it? Um, so we are doing that food drive uh, from now through the end of October. So you may uh, give a check or cash or donate online. Uh, this is the Pub Ministries uh, offering to North Raleigh Ministries Food Bank because, as Kathy said, the need is great right now. Uh, if you do write a check, make it payable to St. Philip. On the memo line, put NRM Food Bank, North Raleigh Ministries Food Bank. Ditto if you give cash in an envelope, put North Raleigh Ministries Food Bank. And if you give online, same thing there, put NRM Food Bank so we can make sure it goes there. We are also collecting non-perishable food items. You can put them back there. Last week... We collected $275 as well as uh, several food items. So we're off to a good start. We hope to continue that today and through the end of October. Thank you very much. Please stand for our call to worship. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who spoke in the beginning and created something out of nothing. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who took on the clothing of humanity to set those who were oppressed free. Let us worship the triune God. Let us, Let us worship, worship the one whose spirit rests continually upon us, calling us from sorrow-filled endings to bright new beginnings. Welcome to worship. Please join me as we confess our sin together. We need to confess, God of Abraham and Lazarus, how often we are not content with the simple gifts and lives you offer. Tempted by everything, we can become insensitive to those who have nothing. Encouraged by the world to accumulate more, we may miss the chance to gather your goodness and godliness. Chasing after all which has no value, we may not have the energy to pursue the faith, the love, the gentleness you have for us. Forgive us, God of reversals. You have sent the one who speaks the words we need to listen to in order to have life. Help us to remember how you have redeemed us and in remembering May, May we make that good, good confession that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, now and forever. Amen. Amen. This is the good news that comes from God. I will hear your prayers. I will answer with hope and peace. I will deliver you from your sins. God has covered us with grace. Under God's hope, we will find shelter. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 May the faith, hope, and peace of the Lord be with each of you. And, and also, also with you, you, Kathy. Please share a sign of peace with your neighbor and the viewers online. God's peace. I won't be doing this much longer. <laughs> God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace, Karen. God's peace, Walt. God's peace, John. God's peace. 
God's face hurt. Yeah, God's face, God's face. Oh, God's peace. God's really. <laughs> God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. Ah, God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. stand for the reading of the gospel. This Sunday our gospel comes from the 16th chapter of Luke. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linens and feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can come across from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will, be they, will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to, to you, you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated. 
for this morning's children's message right up here in front. Well, I grab some props. All right. If you have a seat right in front of me, if you want to sit up here so you can see, I'm going to be moving some things around here a little bit. All right. Hey, Tristan, yeah, come on up. Oh, and I think we got Oliver and Sully coming too, which is great. Yeah, that's wonderful. All right. <laughs> Last shoe. That happens to me too. That happened to me yesterday. I was walking outside and I, my shoe just popped right off. You going to come sit up here with us, Sully? You can sit back there too. That works. All right. So this morning, I have a question for you. I have something here and I want you to see if you can tell me what is in this cup. Go ahead and take a look. What's in there? Water. That's right. So there's water in there. Now, if I wanted to keep water from spilling out of this cup, what do you think I might do? Ooh, yeah. I might put a lid on. So if we put a lid on it, I have a, happen to have a lid here. If we put a lid on it, then let's see if it at least slows some of the water from falling out of it. You ready? Oh, so there's a little bit of water coming out. But for the most part, it pretty much stopped the water from coming out, didn't it? So we put the lid on there, and it protected the stuff that was in there. Now, our gospel story today, that was a story that we just heard um, Miss Kathy read, uh, is, a really t is a really interesting story. And it kind of reminds me of this cup with this lid on it. Because sometimes we're kind of like this cup, where we have things in our lives that are special to us, that are really, really special to us. And sometimes those things are our toys, or sometimes it's, uh, for some people, it's money. For other people, it's the way that we do things. It's there's that, the, that very special way of doing things is so special to them. And those toys are so special to us, and those kind of things are so special to us. Our family is special to us. That sometimes we do whatever we can in our lives to keep those things safe. So sometimes we're kind of like this cup, and we put a lid on those things that are special so that we can hang on to them and hold on to them forever and ever without letting anything happen to them so that they never fall out away from us, right? So we sometimes we put our special things in, in our cup and we hold on to them. But I have a question for you. If I were to try to put more water in this cup and there's a lid on it, what do you think is going to happen? The water's not going to go in? You want to find out? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see what happens. We're going to pour some water on top of that lid. Is it going in the cup? Where's it going? Into the bowl. It's going into the bowl. It's a good thing I brought a bowl. Otherwise, this carpet would be really wet. Uh, yeah, so there's not, none of the water went inside the cup. And so when we hang on, our, our, our good news today from our gospel story is that um, it was a story where Jesus talked about this rich man. And in this story, this rich man had all of these things in the world that he had a lot of wealth, he had a lot of food, he had a lot of really wonderful, fun, cool things that he kept to himself and he put a lid on his life to keep them to himself and so that he would, nothing would slip away or spill away. I see. And, um, as, and then what we hear is that that rich man then later learned that he was unable to receive new good things and special things from God. And he wanted, he wanted uh, his, his family to know about the, these great and good things from God too. But his family also happened to have lids like this cup on their lives. And so our good news today is a reminder that even when we have special things in our lives, even when we have all these things that are really special to us, that we can hold on to them. But we want to remember that we don't want to put a full lid on our lives so that we can both share those special things with other people, but also so that we can receive other new special good things from God that can also continue to fill up our cups or fill up our lives. Yeah. And so that's our good news today. And it's kind of a tricky, tricky news thing today, but it's also good news that we remember that God is going to always give us good things as long as we keep the lid open on our lives 
to receive those good things. And that's our good news today. And with that, I'd love to invite you to please repeat after me in prayer, and I invite the congregation to join as well. Let us pray. Dear God, Dear God thank you for Jesus, thank you for Jesus who, tells us all these fun stories who tells us all these fun stories about the kingdom of God. Help us to remember to not put a lid on our lives so that we can continue to receive all of your good gifts. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming up, everybody. And remember, don't put a lid on your lives. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you more. Your grace is born, where grace is found, is where you are, where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, where you are, Lord, I am free. Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, Lord, I need you. Good morning. Good morning. Let us pray. 
Good and gracious God, we thank you, we praise you for the gift of this day, uh, this beautiful fall day. We thank you for the change in weather. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and truth, to walk with one another and share our lives with each other. Uh, we ask now that you would speak to us a word of gentleness and tenderness, a word of challenge and conviction, of liberation, freedom, hope, power, and promise. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> My sermon text for today is the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. I'd like to take my sermon title for today uh, based actually on the first few words of verse number 20. My sermon title for today is At Your Gate. At Your Gate. Does this scripture scare the Hades out of you? <laughs> it should. Or at least scare you out of Hades. Ah, that's why I get paid, Jim. This parable or story told by Jesus to a mixed crowd of both his disciples and some Pharisees, so that is both his friends and his opponents, of the rich man and Lazarus, is unique to Luke's gospel, occurring nowhere else in the other three. This story is so difficult and downright unpalatable to us because it is so uncompromising and countercultural. It has to do, obviously, with the dangers and perils of riches, financial wealth, material possessions, worldly prosperity. There are innumerable such passages throughout Scripture which warn us and cry out to us, and yet humanity still continues to dismiss and shrug off most of these admonitions. They are relevant, of course, for any generation, but perhaps most of all for our own which is, of course, the wealthiest generation of the wealthiest country in the history of civilization, which has been increasingly beguiled by the so-called prosperity gospel or the health and wealth gospel, where, wherein Jesus' chief desire for you is that you become rich and affluent. In this modern-day society, we reflexively and uncritically pursue wealth, none of us even thinking that deeply about it, much less allowing ourselves to be challenged by the Christian Scripture's critique of that very pursuit. In Luke chapter 1, it reads, God has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich God has sent away empty. In Luke chapter 6, it reads, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be filled. But woe to you that are rich for you have received your consolation, and woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. In Luke 16, it reads, you cannot serve God and money. In Matthew 19, it says, how hard will it be for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And the second lesson assigned for today from 1 Timothy chapter 6, it reads, We brought nothing into this world. We cannot take anything out of this world. We shall be content then with just food and clothing. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all evil. James chapter 5, it reads, Come now, you rich, weep and howl. For the miseries that are coming upon you, your riches have rotted, your gold and your silver have rusted, and they will eat your flesh like fire. You have lived on this earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts on a day of slaughter. And our first reading assigned for today from Amos condemns those who are at ease and feel secure, lying on beds of ivory, lounging on couches, singing idle songs, drinking wine, anointing themselves with aromatic oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of the house of Joseph. These are just a brief sample. I could go on and on and on. Suffice it to say, the Old Testament prophets are concerned with nothing so much as idolatry and the neglect of the poor and needy. 
and quite the opposite of our contemporary world where both the rich and the poor are des deemed deserving of their respectable statuses, the Bible seems to draw a contrary conclusion that the poor are oppressed and that the rich are oppressive. But most of us, as soon as we hear such passages, we forget them. Many of us will leave here today and immediately begin to think of how we can make more money, climb higher up the corporate ladder, achieve the next promotion and the next pay raise. Many of us make significant life decisions based solely on money. And we will sell out our dreams and our heart's desires because to truly pursue them would entail financial hardship. We say that such passages are really exaggerated by Jesus and the prophets for effect and that if anything, they're really addressed to the super filthy rich, those on the Forbes 500 list who charter jets and vacation in the Hamptons, but they're not really addressed to us. In America, at least, we tend to focus on abortion or LGBTQ issues while never addressing the perils of wealth which is addressed far more frequently in Scripture. We want to be free to pursue the American dream without ever having the fundamentals of that dream challenged or critiqued by Holy Writ. I challenge you like I challenge myself. Let's think about it and answer honestly. Is today's gospel lesson really going to affect any change whatsoever in your life? Will the way you live your life be changed in any tangible fashion because you heard today's text? Verse 19 opens starkly. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. Notice two things, my friend. Number one, he is, as he will remain throughout this parable, unnamed. He is simply a rich man. We will never know his name. He is, quite simply, a category. Rich. Number two, there is no moral judgment here on how he became rich. It doesn't say that he was good, noble, hardworking, intelligent, a wise saver or investor. Nor does it say that he was bad, evil, simply inherited it all by luck, or that he trafficked in drugs, illegal guns, or prostitution. In essence, it doesn't say whether he deserved his wealth or not, whether it was a blessing or ill-gotten gain. Shouldn't that matter? Herein, he's simply rich. Verse 20 is equally stark. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come, even the dogs, and lick his sores. Again, please notice two things. Number one, this poor man is named Lazarus. He's poor, but his identity is not bound up in his economic or financial status. His identity transcends that. He may be indigent and homeless, but he has a name, and his name is Lazarus. Number two, once again, there is no moral judgment on how he became poor. Was he worthy, intelligent, hardworking, but down on his luck and slipped through the cracks? Did he simply lack health insurance, get into a medical crisis and lose everything? Or was he lazy and shiftless his whole life? A bum, a criminal, an undeserving robber or thief? We don't know. It doesn't say. It does not indicate whether he deserved his poverty any more than whether the rich man deserved his riches. All we know is that one man was rich and the other was poor. That's it. That's all. No conditions. No qualifiers. 
it would affect the way I read the parable, at least, if I knew that the rich man was deserving and Lazarus was not. Or vice versa, that the rich man was undeserving and Lazarus was. But no such details are provided by Jesus here, which is intriguing, to say the least. Verse 22 continues the starkness. That is, no subtlety, no shades of ambiguity. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The older translation says, to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, that is, hell, where the rich man was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. Again, the older translation says, and Lazarus in his bosom. Abraham, you may recall, was that Old Testament patriarch God chose back in Genesis 12 in order to bless the whole world. He was the father of Isaac, the grandfather of Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. Verse 24, the rich man called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. We see that heaven has cool waters, and Hades, or hell, flames of fire. Verse 25, but Abraham said, child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so and no one can cross from there to us. Again, it is disconcerting to me and actually downright terrifying to accept this text at face value. There is no moral or ethical judgment or critique being made here on either the rich man or Lazarus's worthiness or unworthiness. In this particular parable, it seems to be a zero-sum game in the most uncompromising and countercultural of terms. One person is rich and goes to Hades. The other is poor and goes to heaven. One receives good things in his physical life here on earth and suffers for all eternity, while the other receives evil things in his physical life here on earth, but prospers for all eternity. But when I stop and think about it for a second, this starkness is not unique to this particular parable. Perhaps what is so revolutionary about Jesus' teachings, and one could argue, contributed to his being murdered because he posed a threat, is that there seemed to be no qualifiers and no modifiers. The first shall be what? Last. And the last shall be first, period. The humble shall be exalted, and the exalted shall be humbled, period. He who gains his life loses it, and he who loses his life gains it, period. Sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes all entered the kingdom of heaven before Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders like me and who dress like this, period. He who loves his life loses it, but he who hates his life in this world keeps it for eternal life. Indeed, the gospel has been said to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable, period. And to top it all off, it's all apparently irreversible in eternity. The chasm is unbridgeable. If we really believe this as is, if we really took this seriously, There would be so much self-assessment, so much introspection, so much repentance. Our whole world would be turned upside down. We'd be giving stuff away rather than amassing it. We'd be pouring ourselves out rather than filling ourselves up. At a bare minimum, our generosity would explode all around us. At a bare minimum, our tithe to our church would go up. 
We'd give a little bit to every beggar at the intersection. And at every transaction, at every keypad, we'd tap that little button to donate one, two, or three extra dollars to whatever cause or research is on there. Verse 27. He said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that they will not come close, come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Suggesting a unanimity of Scripture's testimony on this very issue. Moses, you see, stands for the law, since it was to him that God revealed God's law. And the law and the prophets are two of the three major divisions of the Hebrew Bible. The only scripture that they had at the time, what we Christians now call the Old Testament. So everyone who can read can consider themselves duly warned. Verse 30. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, implying Lazarus, they will repent. Abraham replied, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Of course, there is an obvious irony here. It hasn't happened yet at the time of the telling of this parable, but the one who is telling it, Jesus the Christ, will in fact, presumably in a few weeks from this very telling, die and be raised from the dead. And in that monumental, history altering, life saving event, the great chasm affixed between heaven and hell will have been finally bridged. When Jesus was crucified and died, the Apostles' Creed tells us, based on Scripture, that he descended to hell or to the dead. Then he rose and ascended to heaven. So the good news in this text is that that chasm which was once uncrossable is now crossable. That what was unbridgeable has now been bridged. And not only do we have scripture to warn, guide, and edify us, Moses and the prophets, but now we have a Lord and Savior who has in fact risen from the dead to do exactly the same. So now we know. Now we know. Really, no. <laughs> and we have no more excuses. Now, our sins are forgiven. We are reconciled back to God as God's children. We are eternally loved. All things are now possible. And we are given the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit to amend our sinful lives, to be agents of healing for other people, and really finally to turn this world that we live in today upside down and downside up. So, where to start? What to do? Where to look? I submit to you, my friends, that the real tragedy, the real pain of this text lies in the first four words of verse number 20. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus. The rich man's calling may not have been to save and to heal the world. It may not even have been to give all of his money to the nation of Israel. But by God, he could do something about the situation at his gate. To enter and exit his own home, he had to pass by his gate. And therein lies the grave sin. Come on up a little higher. Turning a blind eye to the great suffering at your gate. Please notice, my friends, verse 24. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, Lazarus, to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue. He knows Lazarus's name. 
He knew his name. You don't have to solve world hunger, my friends. But you can solve the hunger at your gate. You can't bring about world peace. But you can enact peace at your gate. You can't heal the world. But you can heal your gate. At your gate. It's what you see. What you pass by. What is evident to you. Oftentimes on a daily basis. Your family is your gate. Your friends are your gate. Your job is your gate. Your school is your gate. This church, St. Philip Lutheran Church, is your gate. If you observe someone being mistreated, abused, belittled, and humiliated, guess what? You are observing them. You are seeing them. It's coming to your attention because they are where? At your gate. I would even suggest to you that the beggar at the intersection that you pull up to at a stoplight is for that brief moment in time at your gate. And ditto for the keypad alluded to earlier at many of your business transactions. The North Raleigh Ministries food bank displays you will see as you leave here today are literally at your gate. And when you soon hear about an opportunity called One Wake, and you will from me and or Kai, guess where that will be too? <laughs> At your gate. Your gate actually travels with you. Your gate goes with you. It presents opportunities to you a couple or a few times a day to help somebody else out. Who's at your gate, my friends? Do you know them? Do you know their name? Because they are there and they are in need. And if this parable is true, we can no longer avoid them or ignore them. And our generosity should explode all around them. And once we do that, and we will do that, it will be said of us that though we were prosperous, we saw, we detected, and we were grieved over the ruin of the house of Joseph. And we will then be able to join our voices with Lazarus and untold numbers of other saints down through the ages and sing together when I went down to the valley, to the valley to pray. My soul, it got so happy that I stayed all the day. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul at your gate. Amen. Bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul. In the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul. The bosom of Abraham, oh, rock of my soul. We wish to thank you for your support of the ministries here at St. Philip. It is through your generous and continuous support that our mission goes forward to the gate and beyond. Thank you. We are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one. Praise to the Father from 
come and all praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. And all praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. And what we do at the gate. Please stand and join as we sing our profession of faith this morning. In this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear, there is only one foundation, we believe, we believe. In this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation, we believe. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. Let our faith be more than hand bombs, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptations, we believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father, we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. Let the lost be loud and the dead be raised in the here and now. Let love invade. Let the church live loud. Our God will say, We believe, we believe. And the gates of hell will not prevail. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back. He's coming back again. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples saying, This cup is the sign of the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together, let us pray as Jesus asks us. Our, Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be your name. name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, your, your will, will be done, done on earth, earth as, as in heaven. heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the distribution. After we commune the band, we will invite you to come forward in a single file line down the center aisle to receive the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the conferral of eternal life. Beautiful God, laying your majesty aside, you reached out in love to show me life, lifted from darkness into light. Oh, oh, oh.
We ask that you please rise at this time to receive our post-communal blessing. Now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have set before us this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, St. Philip Lutheran Church here in wonderful Raleigh, North Carolina. Good morning, Man. I am Sunny Sunflower, and, and I have been asked here to introduce the theme for the 2022 Stewardship Campaign. Without further ado, may I have the envelope, please? Thank you. I can see that you are all on the edge of your seats out there. The theme for your 2022 St. Philip Stewardship Campaign is What Can I Be Doing? Yes. Our campaign focuses on the hardest working member of nature, the bee. I don't know about you all, but I sure do love bees. <laughs> to, to help with their introduction, I would like to call on our very own Busy Bee and her family. Let's give Busy Bee and her family a warm welcome, everyone. Oh, this is so exciting. All these wonderful bees. Thank you, Busy. <laughs> Much of the world relies on the selfless work of a single bee. Nearly all plants would not exist without their pollinating effort of bees. The beehive consists of countless bees selflessly working together to achieve a common purpose. In addition to the endless creation of food from their pollinating efforts, the pollen is returned to feed the hive. The byproducts of their work produce products like honey and wax, which we use and consume every day in countless products. Life would cease without the devotion of bees. Oh, how we are thankful for this magnificent creation of God. Thank you, Busy. <laughs> Our stewardship campaign will last for the next four weeks. Today, we have introduced our theme, and we encourage you to take this week to further understand the incredible gift of the bee and how the hive and all of nature benefits from the tireless efforts of Busy and her family. On Sunday, October 2nd, we will send out our bees to collect your pollen. We'll ask each of you to fill out our bee form. And this form will be found in your bulletin, both printed and online. And we ask that you list on this form, how do I use my time, talents, and financial resources to share the love of Christ here at St. Philip and throughout our community? 
We want you to include all that you do here at St. Philip, like committees, choir, workday, whatever it is, as well as in our community, whether it's Habitat for Humanity, donating blood, PTA, it doesn't matter. List them all and we will collect them over the following two weeks. On Sunday, October 16th, all of your pollen will have been collected, AKA your responses, and will have been turned into honey and they'll be hanging in the narthex and outside the hallway here at Crossing. We hope to lift up all that you do, and by doing so, encourage you to explore how to make God's world a little better, one B action at a time. <laughs> this week of October 16th will also be a week of prayer and thanksgiving for all the great work being accomplished by our congregation and how we can do more in outreach and service to our community and the world. Finally, on October 23rd will be Commitment Sunday, a time of celebration, a time to present your pledge cards for 2023. Anything else, Busy? Busy says to all of you, be loving, be generous, be serving, and be joyful. Thank you, Busy Bee, and thank you to all the little bees. And most of all, thank you, St. Philip. Thank you. Oh, nope, not quite. <laughs> we got to be sent first. Oh. <laughs> okay. Kind of That's out. kind of a tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> so if you'd please rise for our sending blessing and then our sending song. May the Lord be with us as we go from here, and may we carry his love to the world. May we put others before ourselves and offer ourselves as servants to all. May we show his love to our neighbors so that they know the church has left the building. it all away, away, we're giving it all to go your way, we're giving it all away, away, we're giving it all to go. freedom there is hope in the name that is jesus lay your life down give it all now we are found in the love of the savior we come alive in you set free to show the truth our lives will never be the same we're giving it all Giving it all to go your way. We're giving it all away, away. We're giving it all to go your way. We are sold out to your calling. Everything that we are for your glory. Take our hearts now. Have it all now, let our life shine your life like the morning. We've come alive in you, set free to show.
show the truth. Our lives will never be the same. We're giving it all away, away. We're giving it all. We're giving it all away, away. We're giving it all to go your way, away with sin. Roll back the curtains from our eyes and now we can see you you've shown us your way your truth and life we offer our lives to bring you fame we're caught in your freedom we're caught in your freedom we're giving it all Giving it all to go your way. We're giving it all away, away. We're giving it all to go your way. I think that's the theme song for the uh, stewardship campaign, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Go in peace, keep your lid off, and think about those and act for those at the gate. Thanks be to Thanks God. Be to God.